we're here this morning to interview Michael L. Hubbard. Uh, Michael was born August of 1968 in Azle, Texas. He was in the U.S. Army, uh, both Reserve and Regular Army, from 1999 until the year 2007. His highest rank attained was E-5, which I guess was a Spec 5? No, it's Basic Sergeant. No. Basic Sergeant, okay. Uh, my name is Dale Dexheimer. I'll be conducting the interview. I'm with the Burleson Heritage Foundation. I have no relationship with Michael Hubbard. We're doing this interview for the Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress. We're uh, in Burleson, Texas, and today is Friday, May the 21st, 2010. And with that little intro, Michael, uh, we'll just go on and you can tell us about your, uh, your years in the U.S. Army and maybe what led you there and, and just some of your experiences, sir. Okay. Um, well, in 1999, I'd lost my job. <laughs> Well, actually, I'd quit it. Uh, got back from D.C. and decided to join the military, uh, something I'd always wanted to do. So went in, took the tests, uh, the ASFAB tests, passed, and uh, they sent me over to MEPS in Dallas. Passed everything there, uh, except for the weight. I was a little chubby then. Uh, they let, uh, they gave me a pass on the weight and. Uh, tested out on everything and ended up with uh, communications as my job. Um, off the ASFAB, I'd scored high on everything that re related to uh, the mechanical field. Uh, didn't want to be a grease monkey again. I'd done that before. So I chose uh, communications. Uh, this, that part of the communications that I was going to be uh, going into I uh, did everything with uh, RF communications, telephones, satellites, computers, uh, software, hardware computers, all that stuff, uh, setting up areas and uh, maintaining. Uh, one of the sergeants used to joke that uh, uh, 25 uniform was a uh, jack of all trades and a master of none, which is pretty much true, <laughs> but it was a fun job. Uh, well, told my recruiter, um, I'm out of work, let's go to basic as soon as you can get me on the plane. And uh, she got me on the plane within a month. Went to a, a basic training in uh, Fort Jackson, which uh, dur went during the summertime, so that was an enjoyable experience. Uh, basic training was basic training. Went in, all you have to do is your job. They tell you when and where to do it, go do it. It's as simple as that. AIT was at Fort Gordon, uh, Georgia. That was a little bit nicer, but still during the summertime. <laughs> uh, it was a good school. Went uh, 17 weeks, and it was nothing but you wake up in the morning, do PT, go to school, study, go back to sleep, throw some uh, food in there on occasion, and then you're good to go. Uh, after AIT, went back home, found another job, which was a good thing, and uh, reported in to uh, the 493rd Engineer Group, which was based out of Dallas. Uh, they're a reserve group. Um, spent my whole time with the 493rd, which, not a bad group to be with. Uh, you weren't with the battalions, but as a communication soldier, I supported battalion communications, which meant, uh, as some people would put it, as the weekend water warrior we were, we'd get dropped into an area, our bosses would tell us, we need communications up in eight hours. Eight hours later, you had communications from the group level all the way down to your battalions. That's uh, setting up RF, communications, which are the radios, telephones, satellites, computers, everything. Uh, one of the jokes that the full-timers say is, you know, we don't get enough practice, or uh, we don't do our jobs 24-7, when uh, we actually have to know our jobs a little bit better than the full-timers. 
they get the 24-7 opportunities to work on their jobs. We get 16 hours in a weekend, 48. We have to be up and running, which made you learn your job and it made you learn it quick and well. Uh, from 99 all the way up to 03, it was reserve work. Uh, did a lot of work down in Fort Hood at months at a time, uh, volunteering to uh, do warfighter exercises, which is a computer-based program. Uh, spent some time out in the field doing engineer ops. Uh, one of the things as a communication soldier, after you set it up, all you have to do is maintain it. As long as it doesn't break down, it'll work. Nine times out of ten, the stuff works. Uh, the little times it does break down, it's a matter of a little fix. We call it operator uh, error, because all you had to do is walk up and go, well, sir, you got to turn the volume up. And then send them on their way. Or dim switch, sir, got to turn it up. Uh, if it did break down, troubleshoot the part, put the new part in, get the part fixed. Simple as that. Uh, 03. Uh, of course, everybody knows the rattling of the sabers to uh, get everybody together to go to uh, Iraq. Of course, Afghanistan was still running. Didn't get to go there. Hmm? Thank gosh. Uh, we got word that we were going to get orders to uh, mobilize to go to Iraq. Simple enough, we got the unit prepared. A few of us went in early. I think it was six months earlier than the... Uh, orders were going to start, and we started getting the unit ready to move. Uh, went down to Fort Hood for uh, training. Uh, they're not just going to dump a bunch of reservists or National Guards into a combat zone without some type of training. Full-timers go to NTC, reserves and National Guard went to Fort Hood and did the ramp up to uh, be ready to go into a combat zone. Uh, early part of 03, we got our jet plane, and we flew over to uh, Kuwait. Flew into Kuwait and uh, got set up to move across the border. Uh, when we showed up, the main uh, war fighters had already moved into Iraq, and they were pushing towards Baghdad. Everybody knows it took three weeks to get to Baghdad, uh, rather quick, <laughs> in a combat zone. Uh, we were right on their heels. We got there. We probably spent a week in Kuwait, got our equipment together, made sure everything worked, mounted up, and we left. Uh, on the trip up, the uh, full-timers and the reserves and the National Guard that were already there that pushed into Baghdad had cleaned a pretty good path. The major highways were open. Some of the, uh, well, they call them MSRs and ASRs, major supply route and alternate supply route. We pushed on whatever we could get onto to get up there. Uh, did catch a little bit of fire on the way up, but you're in a war zone, you expect it. Uh, got through the initial push up and everybody was kind of situated. Uh, we set up on the west side of Biop, the Baghdad Engi International Airport, uh, which that was a fun little area to be in. Uh, when we sat up, we were in tents. Uh, there was an engineer unit that was ahead of us, an engineer group that was ahead of us, that they found out we were coming and we were going to take over a certain area from them so they wouldn't have the entire country of Iraq to engineer. Uh, they had they'd been nice to us and graded and laid a little rock down for us so we could put our tents in which was really nice. Uh, oh, and by the way, Iraq is hot as hell in the summertime. And nobody has air conditioning. Hotter, so Hotter in Texas. Oh, it makes Texas feel like Alaska. It is miserable there. The mosquitoes <clears throat> do fly in formation and they do ta attack in squads. Uh, when we got to our little slice of the pie we set up, they gave us about, oh, I don't know, three minutes to uh, get set up and prepare. It took every bit of a month to make sure we had everything 
set up and livable. This is for living space. For working space, we had it set up in less than eight hours. Uh, as a communications uh, sergeant then, at, on a 03, or in 03, I was a sergeant. Uh, I was helping, a, uh, helping my master sergeant with 10 other troops below us. Uh, we had to set up everything in a matter of, it was less than a day when we got everything set up and running correctly. Uh, the reason why it took us so long was the communications people, which would be the G6 level, which is up there beyond anybody's pay grade, uh, was in a little disarray, we'll say. <laughs> they, uh, they got us the information we need and we started doing our operations. Um, at that point, when we pushed into our Iraq, I was uh, officially with the 1st Armored Division. Uh, they were the, yes, they were out of uh, Germany then. And uh, very, very good people to be with. Uh, very knowledgeable and very helpful. Uh, got set up, started our engineer ops, which uh, pretty much leads into convoys for getting supplies, uh, supporting the battalions that were uh, there, the combat battalions that were up and running and running uh, 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 like bridges that were blown up during the main battle for, uh, ahead of us, that was just ahead of us. Uh, blew up bridges and roads and infrastructure and everything else. Uh, <laughs> We, uh, we started doing our Bridge X projects. We're putting bridges back and everything else like that. Uh, very busy times. Uh, well, said something about convoys. Everybody knows about convoys in Iraq and Afghanistan, but in Iraq, uh, from my perspective, they were quite interesting. Uh, you sent your people out to go get supplies or go to work zones and stuff like that and everybody had to go out uh, that was able to help support the convoy until you got to the job site. So uh, troops that were engineers turned into convoy experts and when they turned into convoy experts uh, they also had to do their job. Same with the signal guys, same with the uh, food guys. Everybody, it was a learning curve, very, very fast learning curve there. Uh, convoys were an experience. Uh, I always told my guys that uh, worked for me in my section that I won't send you on something that I haven't done or haven't gotten pretty decent at. So at the first part, I was volunteering for my master sergeant for me to go on a convoys so my guys could, uh, so I could get the knowledge to pass on to my troops just for that reason. I'm not going to send you and do something I wouldn't be able to do or wouldn't do. Uh, put me in a couple of situations that would prefer not to be in, but hey, I'm still here, I'm still breathing, and I can still walk. Uh, I can't say that about everybody that I saw on a convoy, but that happens in a combat zone. Uh, that was the pretty much the first part of the of that area there. Uh, <laughs> one of the funny stories was uh, I call it my little Cy Young Award winner. We were going uh, on a convoy down to southeast Baghdad, and uh, of course I was a saw gunner as a sergeant, which is unheard of, but in the reserves, you do what you got to do. Uh, I was in the lead vehicle uh, in the back of the Humvee. This was before they were up armoring everything and uh, sitting on a little stool with a little gun mount with my saw up. And I looked up on the overpass and saw this kid on the overpass. Well, at that time, they were throwing grenades at you. Little kids, big kids, didn't matter who. Uh, looked up, saw this little kid, 
and uh, he reached down, picked something up off the ground. Nobody, nobody saw it except for me, apparently, because I didn't hear it. We had a little makeshift intercom system, and the guys that were in the Humvee didn't see it. Well, I had made up my mind, I'm not going to shoot a little kid. I'm going to scare the little kid if it looks like a grenade. Well, we're doing 70, and he's up there on top of that overpass like anywhere else in the United States. And he rears back, looked like a great pitching arm, and he winged a rock. I, did, I saw it, it was a rock. I'm not going to shoot a kid over a rock. Well, subsequently, that rock was traveling at oh my god fast and tagged me right to Cape Heart right here. Knocked me out of the back, knocked me off my little seat, and I'm holding on for dear life with my toes through the combat boot. That was the only thing that kept me from smacking the uh, highway. Well, the only thing that the convoy knew was I got shot in the head. They didn't know it was a rock. They were all looking out the sides and the driver was looking at the bumper in front of him. So it went out, Sergeant Hubbard shot in the head. Well, convoy stopped to put me in the back and uh, the medic comes running up. She looks at me and she goes, dude, you got hit in the head with a freaking rock. All right. Yeah, I got hit in the head with a rock. It hurt. I was, you know, concussion and all that stuff. And, uh, the soldiers saw, the soldiers had seen the little kid running off the bridge that was in the uh, vehicles behind me. Uh, after everything was happening, they took off and grabbed the little kid, brought him back to me. And this is me with a concussion doing this number, blinking, got a little blood running, you know, nothing major. They asked me what I wanted to do with him. And I was like, well, let the little shit go. I don't need, not, he's a little kid. He's doing what his dad or his mom told him. Not gonna hurt a little kid. Uh, officers on the convoy said, nope, we're taking him with us. Oh shit. Took him to the uh, fire base. Uh, they interviewed the kid and they didn't hurt him in any way. Don't, I hope everybody understands that. They didn't hurt the kid. They asked him why he threw a rock. And a uh, little kid said, well, Daddy told me to throw a rock every time. He saw a uh, convoy going by or soldiers going by. You throw a rock at them. Okay, we can put up with that. They uh, let the little kid go to put him back on the overpass. And then this is what they were telling me. Put him back on the overpass and he scurried away like a scared little rabbit. It's good enough for me. Uh, while at the fire base, medics checked me out put two fingers up in front of me from what they were telling me, and I said 18. So pretty good concussion. Uh, there wasn't enough of us on the convoy for uh, me not to be behind a weapon, so they put me in a position in the convoy where I could still uh, provide security, and we went back to our little fire base. Uh, that was my little Cy Young Award winner, so. That was pretty fun, uh, now that I look back at it. But while I was there, it was a little scary. Uh, but convoys were like that. Uh, before I get way too far into this, I also want to say that being in an engineer group, uh, we were combat engineers. Uh, well, they were combat engineers. I was a signalman. Uh, one of the things we did when we got there was the uh, lead general said we have to rebuild the in infrastructure and we have to do it now. So that's what we were doing. We did a lot of rebuilding of schools. We did a lot of rebuilding of hospitals, uh, roads, bridges, uh, all the infrastructure. Um, like the electric plant, the uh, Air Force knocked that out by you know, bombing it, uh, which was a good shot. They didn't destroy it totally. They just knocked everything off their, off kilter. So they had to put it back. One of the things the engineers did while they were there was got one of the turbine, turbines, yeah, turbines back online so everybody could have electricity. It only ran part of the time, but 
it ran like during the day and then at night it would shut off until they got all the parts <coughs> to fix it. Uh, but I want to make sure everybody knows that. It wasn't just there to kick people in the back backside and kill and maim and all that other stuff. We were there to help support them after we took care of uh, a couple of little chuckleheads that were running that country. So uh, that's a major point I want to make sure everybody knows about. Uh, well, everybody knows about IEDs. You've read about them. They're there. They're all over the place. When we first started going on convoys, they were command detonated, which meant there had to be somebody relatively close to hit the button to make it explode. Uh, those were kind of easy to find because nobody ever got it through their head that you had to bury the wire from the switch to the bomb. So if you're on a convoy and you see wires running out to the desert, stop, you know. See if you can find the guy to shoot at him, make him go away to get the bomb squad there to blow it up. Uh, they did get creative though. Uh, it's kind of funny, but uh, they were hiding IEDs and dead animals, like dogs and horse, or not horses, but sheep and goats and stuff like that. Uh, make it harder for us to see. They didn't get the uh, wires buried, so they you could still see them. Uh, which I think, if I remember right, in the Muslim culture, you're not supposed to mess with dead animals but they were still stuffing them full of explosives trying to get us. Uh, I, never, I never saw one, but the guys that have gone out on a convoy that worked for me while we were over there had found them. Uh, I usually ended up finding, or being on the convoy that found the uh, uh, unexploded howitzer rounds that were daisy chained, like five, I think the biggest one was, there was 20 of them daisy chained together. And uh, when you daisy chain them, you have like the start here and the end here, and they're all wired together, and they all explode at once. So they wait, it's almost like an ambush. You wait for a convoy to get into where all the rounds can go off at once to kill the entire convoy. Uh, they were very, very uh, dangerous. So if you find one, generally there's another one around. Uh, been on a bunch of convoys where we had found them on the side of the road and had to provide security until the bomb squad could show up because you don't want the little kids or you know, the people that want us there helping them to walk across and be blown up. So you provided security, either got shot at or somebody had the uh, uh, intestinal fortitude to stay there and wait until we got in a good position and then blew it. Uh, have been around when they did blow up. It's not a very pretty sight. It uh, wreaks a lot of havoc. And uh, a lot of people uh, still have troubles with that. Uh, I know of soldiers that today, they haven't been in a combat zone for years. They see trash on the side of the road, they'll turn around and go the other way. Uh, so it's something that people contend with uh, all the time. Uh, but I do, uh, yes, I have notes. Uh, relief efforts. Uh, one of the funny thing we, funniest things we did while we were there doing combat operations and rebuilding and everything else were the relief efforts. Uh, soldiers would tell us, I, there's a school over here that, you know, it's rebuilt, but they need supplies for the kids. So uh, people from the U.S., our first sergeant was big about getting us school supplies. Well, we went to the first school and we dropped off school supplies, but the little kids were running around without any shoes or the clothes were tattered or stuff like that, uh, or they didn't have food or water. So uh, we would go back and drop off, you know, shoes and clothes and food and water and sometimes it was some of our rations that we'd drop off you know because we knew we could get more but we didn't know when they were going to be able to eat again uh, 
that was that was fun. That was because everybody there really enjoyed you being there. They really wanted to show you what they were learning because you had rebuilt their school or uh, the clinics, you know, that we were rebuilding. Uh, yes, we did get shot at a lot. Uh, I think one of the sergeants had counted when we first got there, there was uh, 60, 60 or 90, and I can't remember the exact number, but every night in between midnight and four, when you really get some good sleep, they would shoot rockets and mortars at you. Uh, we were about 300 meters, three to 400 meters away from this one wall that went around Biop. And there was a road on the outside of that. And insurgents would come screaming down the road in the middle of the night, stop, lift up their mortar or rocket, shoot it. And we were just in a good position where it goes straight over the top of us. And it was pretty neat because if you're on guard duty, it was like the 4th of July, you could look up and watch the sparks going over your head. Uh, we did catch some of those rounds. Uh, July 4th, <laughs> during the day, we were doing a barbecue and uh, we had hot dogs and hamburgers and stuff like that. And uh, me and a couple of other sergeants were barbecuing on the, these makeshift barbecues we'd made out of 55 gallon drums. Look up, and I still remember it vid vividly today. You could watch the mortars leaving the tubes or coming over the wall and uh, landed on our position. That was pretty interesting. Uh, they generally throw half dozen, dozen at you and then take off running. Uh, but uh, the artillery guys took care of that problem after we, after they figured out where they were shooting from, they affixed to those positions and every time somebody'd call out uh, incoming, somebody'd call it in and they'd just bomb the shit out of the area. Make the, earl work, uh, make the whole earth shake. <laughs> it was nice. Uh, but that July 4th, it was kind of neat because you could look over and watch those mortars come up. And then, of course, we returned the fire. And uh, I do believe we got some of them that day. So, it w uh, but we ended up, we stopped them from shooting mortars at us. And there was, oh, this was the fun one. One night, and I remember this one because I was on guard duty. We had a fuel depot 150 meters away. And uh, they shot. I know they were shooting at the first AD guys that were across the uh, runway. Uh, these rounds fell short for some reason and fell right on top of the fuel depot. And you watch the round come in and land right in the mid big middle of these fuel bags they had out. There were thousands of gallons of fuel in them. It just went up like fireworks, man. It was huge, hot. Oh my goodness. Just that fuel burning off, it was incredibly hot. But uh, that was that was most interesting, that one. Uh, <laughs> one of the things we were doing, and I would, uh, like, we'd get parts in. And before, uh, the transportation guys really got set up, we'd have to go back to Kuwait to get them. So there'd be a little uh, two, three, four vehicle convoy run down from Baghdad to Kuwait to go get these parts. And uh, I remember going down there one time and I'd made four or five trips like that. And on the way back, and I don't know if anybody else recognized it, but I did. When you come out of Kuwait, you go into a little no man's zone and the little Kuwaiti guards are over here. You go through the no man zone, and then you bump over this huge bump, and it seemed like the smell started. And Iraq has a certain smell to it. It's horrible, I thought. But you go bump over that one little bump, and I'd always get mad, kicking and screaming, because I was back in Iraq. But uh, <laughs> we were crossing over again, going back to Baghdad to drop parts off looked over and there's little mud huts. And I forget the, what these people were called, but uh, Saddam had just totally decimated them. Um, it used to be a swampland in that area, and that's where these people lived. 
and uh, it's all dried up now because he cut channels and all this other stuff to make bad debt or make bad debt into a big garden. But uh, these people were dirt poor. I mean, all they had were goats. And uh, I remember this little girl about yay tall. And I'd go, we'd go cutting across and she was skinny as a rail. You could see bones. And uh, she was waving at us and she was expecting somebody to throw candy. Well, I took my MRE for the day and just winged it out the door to her. And uh, <laughs> she looked like a freaking receiver. She took off running because I'd missed. I didn't throw right. You know, I could throw a grenade and hit somebody with it, but I can't throw an MRE. Threw it in front of her. She took off running, and all the other little kids saw what I threw. They took off running after her. Well, Mom's watching this whole thing transpire in front of her, and I don't know how she's... Uh, I think this is what she was saying in Arabic was, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Well, kid, just make a beeline for that front door. Mom closed the door, and you know in the cartoons where you see all the wasp hit the wall? That's what the kids look like. Pow! Right up against that wall. Just made it. So, you know, dropping food off like that to little kids all over the place was pretty, I think that was the fun, one of the fun things. And then uh, when we first got there, they were rationing water. That was interesting. Uh, they'd give you two bottles in the middle of the summer so you can drink it all or you can shower with one and drink the other one. Okay, in a combat zone, you need like a billion waters to keep you hydrated. Uh, and uh, one of the extra duties I had gotten was a, a, like a first line medic. They call them combat lifesavers. Uh, one of the things we did was pop in uh, IVs to keep, uh, say if you lost a lot of blood, you could put an IV on somebody and it'd replace the fluid or help the body, you know, pump, or uh, keep the heart pumping. Well, another thing it's good for is to uh, rehydrate somebody. So it wasn't unusual for people to be passing out left and right. And you pop an IV in them, you know, and put it in their pocket and say, stay in the shade until it's done, and then I'll, maybe I can be back, come and pull the IV out of you. If I'm not, take the tape off, pull straight out. If it stops bleeding, keep going. So the uh, two bottles of water was an interesting experience. A lot of people didn't bathe. <laughs> So, but we did get the, uh, we did get shower facilities and all that hooked up for them. So that was pretty good. Uh, other than that, it combat zone. I mean, you see stuff you don't want to see and do stuff you don't want to do, but you have a mission to, uh, to yourself and to the people around you that you get your job done so other people can live. And that's what it pretty much came down to. Uh, take care of my troops. Uh, we started out with 10. We came home with nine. Uh, one of them we sent back because he hurt his back. He was doing work around the compound and uh, the doctors thought he was joking, but this kid, he, he's a little kid, uh, all of 18 uh, in a combat zone, which I just still floored by. Uh, Hurt his back trying to lift something that weighed as much as he did. And uh, come to find out he compressed two discs in his back and still was in a combat zone for two months until we got the doctors talked into sending him to Germany for a scan. And when they got there, they said, oh, yep, two compressed discs. Sorry, we should have fixed this a long time ago. Sent him on to Sam Houston and got him fixed and he's happy and healthy. but. Uh, my master sergeant and I went with 10, we came back with nine. And that one was just because he hurt his back. So out of everything we did, that's the most dang, that's the biggest thing I'm most proud of is I took troops into a combat zone and I brought them all home. Uh, whether or not they're happy and healthy, that's on them now. I don't have any say in the matter, but I pretty much think that's it. I mean. I believe. Came, I'm sorry, you came back. When did you come back, Johnny? What year? 04. 04. And then you were in a reserve unit? I was uh, from 04 to 07, I was in a reserve unit. Uh, after 
we got back from Iraq, we were given another mission. Uh, well, the 493rd before they were disbanded, uh, our operational area was South America, uh, Guatemala, Belize, El Salvador, all those areas. So if they needed engineers, they would call the 493rd group. We'd get the battalions together and move them into that country. Uh, El Salvador is a good example. Uh, they had uh, earthquakes, something of that nature. And uh, we got a, the battalions together and sent people down to uh, rebuild uh, water wells, um, schools, hospitals, roads, all that stuff. Um, let's see, it was, yeah, Guatemala, El Salvador, Belize, a couple of other little places. Well, good. That's a, quite a story, really. Let me, uh, let me go back and ask you a few questions here. I've made some notes here, Michael. Okay. Um, <clears throat> how long was you, your basic at Fort Jackson? How long was that? Fort Jackson, South Carolina, right? Correct. Uh, let's see, eight. Eight or nine weeks, and didn't really. Stuff you see in the movies. Yeah, it's just basic training. They teach you how to be a soldier. All it comes down to is you got to follow orders, like I said earlier. Discipline. Yeah, discipline. You're not you're not lead dog anymore. You work for somebody else, and it's uh, it keeps people alive when you go through basic training. They teach you your basic soldier skills so you can keep other people alive, keep yourself and other people alive. You mentioned the 493rd was a good group. How many guys in that, in that unit? Uh, we were... Uh, Battalion strength? No, 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 we're company strength. Okay. Yeah, I think 75, uh, probably about 20 officers, which that'll give you a headache and butt rash every time. But uh, they were all pretty much good officers. And what a group level does is uh, the officers send down the knowledge and the op orders and everything else for the battalions to go to work. Uh, they're the ones that from on higher comes to the group level. They disseminate the information that needs to be done, uh, coordinate um, gravel, slumbers, cement, asphalt, all that junk to go to the battalions. Uh, my job as a communications uh, soldier or sergeant uh, was to make sure that their communications with upper and lower and uh, everybody else around to maintain those communications. That way they could get those missions down. And then plus uh, we supported the battalions with the same uh, communications. When you started with the 493rd, you were still reservist. Correct. What were you doing as a civilian at that time? What was I doing? Uh, I think I was working for Lowe's okay. at the time. Yeah. Something that was totally not related to communications. Okay. Uh, moving on to Iraq. Living conditions in Iraq. How was the food? Uh, MREs. Uh, for the first three months was MREs and uh, uh, not K rats, but uh, C rats, C rations. Come in tins about that big. You don't need anything but hot water to cook them in. So you boil the water and throw them in, and then let them set for a little while, and then take them out and take like a spam thing and open it up, crack it open and put a lot of hot sauce on it. Uh, MREs, MREs, they, you get your favorites and hope to God you can find them in the next case that gets opened up. Uh, later on, while we were there, we built dining facilities for the troops and the food got a hell of a lot better. It went from uh, MREs and uh, Oh, buying vegetables from the Iraqis and stuff in the area. 
while you're on convoys, if you felt secure enough, there'd be markets all over, all over the place. There's beautiful vegetables and fruits. Run over and grab you some vegetables and fruits, take them back, wash them off and eat them with your MRE or your sea rats or something like that. So food was, well, the food sucked at first, but uh, we did buy a couple of goats at some point in time, barbecued them, so that was welcome change. But later on in the uh, in country, with the defects opening up and all that, the food got a lot better. Living in a tent, you have showers? Yeah. Uh, first, we didn't. I think it was like two, three months we didn't have showers, so it was uh, baby wipes. You you know called the family and asked either for baby wipes or uh, you took your bottle of water and washed off, but. Uh, one of the battalions being the uh, geniuses they were, they had tr real world plumbers that uh, put showers up with these big water tanks, plastic water tanks they found throughout the city. And uh, we got to uh, go down there after they, uh, after the battalion showered, we could talk them into, you know, trading for some batteries for a shower. So you got to shower that way until we got our own. Uh, tent life sucked. When we were putting the tents together, we didn't bring enough. We didn't have enough. I don't know where the hell the last two went to, but they weren't there. So my guys, we, my our mass sergeant had us out there, instead of doing running PT, we did tent PT, which was, how fast can you put a tent together? These were those old canvas ones. The metal frames, we put one up in five minutes. Uh, kind of impressive, but really painful. But we put them up for everybody else, and then when it got to us, they ran out of tents. So we had to like, get our own tent. We had the roof, and we had the frame, but there was nothing else. So everybody else was walled in. Uh, Camo guys were sleeping, you know, almost under the stars. Uh, lots of nice camel spiders visiting us scorpions, sand fleas. Those were fun. Uh, but anyway, uh, some of the units that had gone through that area had left stuff behind. And that's how we pieced our tent together. We found a, a wall over here and a wall over there. So we'd get it together, cut it, sew it up, put it, to, put it on the frame. And before too long, we had four walls, a front door and all that neat junk, so it worked out. No air conditioning. We didn't have air conditioning for the first six months. I guess even with your gear, you were a communications outfit. Uh, I guess some of that stuff you had to keep cool, didn't you? We burned up a lot of equipment. <laughs> we had uh, like the power amps in the vehicles. The solder would get so hot that it'd melt and the PA would go out for you. Uh, so we were jerry-rigging little fans to blow the air circulated through. I mean, it would still burn you, but it was keeping it cool enough for it to work. We, we did run into a lot of problems with that, but we figured out little, little things like in 91, those old radios, the uh, soldiers would take a towel, lay it over the top of the radio, and then pour water across it. The evaporating water would leach that heat out. We ended up doing stuff like that. There was some veterans from uh, Desert Storm, Desert Shield, or Shield Storm, whatever. Uh, they uh, they gave us little tricks like that, and it, it worked out. But uh, yeah, we had failures because of heat. Uh, your engineering ops, rebuilding bridges, schools hospitals, etc. Iraqi labor? Uh, sometimes. It depended. Uh, nine times out of ten, if it was rebuilding school, there would be a section out of a battalion that did it. Uh, sometimes the, we would enlist Iraqis. Uh, like if it was, I remember one, it was, uh, what the heck was that? That was a water pump for a a, an air, a village, and it was uh, 
instead of us going and doing it, it was just easier for the guys that had the water pump that we bought from them to go install it. So we just went out and checked to make sure they were doing the work and doing it right. And uh, they got it done for us. But not, not all the, we didn't always let the Iraqis build for us. We built a lot ourselves. Uh, convoys. Typical convoy, you get up early in the morning, go uh, somewhere and come back the same day? Yeah, sometimes. Just depending on what the mission needed. If it was, uh, no, we'll say we'll go to Anaconda one day, uh, which was up north. It was a supply base up north. It may still be there. Uh, you'd wake up real early. We always try, we like to leave at night when uh, everybody was either trying to put the bombs out. That way, when you passed them, you scared the shit out of them, maybe crank off a couple rounds. But uh, we liked going really early and then coming back kind of late. You know, that way there was the opportunity for people to find the IEDs and blow them up in place or def defuse them or whatever. There was a couple of uh, nights where you had to stay over, but you had equipment to, you know, well, you had food and water in your gun, so you stayed overnight. Uh, your Cy Young. Mm -hmm. winner there. I notice on your biographical sheet here, I don't see a Purple Heart. I didn't get one. I didn't want one. Maddox said I was okay, so I kept on running. Why well, get something? I didn't get shot. Don't okay. need it. I just, I just wondered. Okay. Uh, one last thing here. Uh, have you been single all your military? No, no. I was... Uh, Let's see, I met my wife in 2000. This is, this is the big question. Yeah, well, shut up, let me think. Uh, I met my wife in 2000. We dated until uh, I came home on leave and I, we got married. Then I went back over into Iraq. The big joke was, uh, you've got the perfect marriage. You stay here for six months. Or stay here for a little bit, go away for six months. Stay here for a little bit, go. It's a joke, apparently not very funny. Uh, that's about the questions, the comments I had here, Michael. Uh, anything you might want to say in conclusion? It's been a good, you, you've, uh, well, some things certainly you didn't enjoy, but overall it's, it's been a, a good experience and enjoyable. I wouldn't say enjoyable. It was a good experience from the fact that we helped uh, a people that couldn't help themselves. And we, uh, we got the people out of the area that needed to be let. Uh, we got a good portion of the people out. They needed to be out. Other than that, I still think war zone sucks. Can't do anything about that. Somebody's and power is always going to want to fight somebody else. And it's going to be the populace that does it. It's not going to be the people that want the war. So, which I think would be kind of cool to put somebody up, you know, like president against whoever and let them duke it out. Whoever wins gets it. That would be the good one. Very interesting story, Michael. We certainly appreciate you taking the time to come and give us your story. Appreciate your service to the United States of America, sir. No problem. You bet.